on the internet, you decide what you do, right? This is a question that I found on your website, respectmynet.eu. And, uh, well, I don't know what you think. Uh, it sounds quite plausible. But the answer that they give is, maybe not. So, who that is who actually decides what you do on the internet and what consequences that has and what you can do against that, these two men will tell you now. They are Thomas Lohninger, who fought against data retention in Austria and successfully. <laughs> and he has been very active in net politics ever since. He is here with Christopher Talib, campaign manager for La Quadrature du Net, um, the French NGO fighting for civil rights. Welcome. Together they say, make the internet neutral again. Please give them a warm applause. Thanks, everyone. Is the microphone working? Yeah, great. So, um, first I have to say something for that title, if the slides could come up. Okay, we don't have slides so far. Um, yes, we do. So, make the internet neutral again. When we decided to have this title for our talk, uh, this was, of course, before, before Donald Trump became elected. And uh, most of our talk will be about how to enforce net neutrality, how to really keep the internet free and open. But, of course, we also have to, have, uh, have to talk about what will happen in the U.S., um, we both worked on the safety internet, uh, EU campaign. Um, this, um, common effort of various NGOs around Europe started three years ago when the Commission proposed a very disastrous law on net neutrality that would basically abandon the principle. And, uh, we followed the, this, this law throughout the legislative process on all stages and then even through with the regulatory implementation. And, um, this, um, you can all see on safetyinternet.eu, there is now an archive page. Because what's, uh, let's talk a little bit more about this campaign. What is unique here is that we really open sourced every line of code that we wrote for this campaign, uh, including the tools that we used um, for contacting your representatives, the members of the European Parliament, as well as the regulatory agencies. And here you see uh, the traffic graph because we also have visitor statistics from PVIC throughout these three years. And there you can see that we had huge success from various players around Europe, um, from the Netherlands, uh, from a huge shout out to the Reddit community. They were awesome. Um, and also Change.org, Netspolitik.org and Alexander Lehmann helped us a lot, as well as uh, Firefox. Uh, which ran a snippet for safety internet in the last parts of the campaign. And in the final stages of this fight for net neutrality in Europe, we really brought the protests to the streets. There were demonstrations in Barcelona, Riga, Bonn, Brussels and Vienna. And uh, this was really a group effort. At the end, uh, this coalition grew more and more and we had 23 NGOs from 14 countries that joined us in this. And Ultimately, we achieved almost half a million submissions to BEREC, the body of European regulators for electronic communications. And this is really an historic number because all previous consultations of the regulators in Europe had a maximum of around 100 comments. So no, in order um, process, they had so much public interest and engagement. And this really changed the landscape um, within the regulators because suddenly they were observed by the public and before that they were basically hiding behind um, some processes and not really having to engage with uh, their own constituency. If we look at the submissions by country, you can see that Germany has the largest share. Um, this is, of course, because the debate here in Germany is a little bit more nuanced and, and widespread than in other countries. But still, we also had the UK and France and Spain and Italy that contributed a lot through this campaign. And, but I also, being an Austrian, want to point out that a few small countries disproportionately contributed with submissions. Um, Austria, Sweden, Denmark and Belgium really kicked ass and that's probably because they had very good uh, NGOs that although uh, most of them only run with volunteers could really mobilize in their local language to uh, get the word out and get people engaged for net neutrality. So, um, we now have this law and we also have the regulatory implementation. 
So what does it actually say? What type of net neutrality do we have now in Europe for half a billion people? It is no longer possible to just block or censor content based on commercial reasons. So you can no longer prohibit users, the use of voice over IP or messaging or file sharing in the terms of services. There can still be blocking for legal reasons, if you have a law, if you have a court order, but uh, an ISP cannot arbitrarily start blocking parts of the internet. This is clearly prohibited. We have a new right. We have a device freedom now. That means that you can connect any type of device to your internet connection. And your ISP can no longer charge you, for example, for using your phone's internet on your laptop, tethering. Um, that's really good and, and absolutely clear. Also on specialized services, I'm particularly happy that we reached this result because this was maybe 60% of the whole debate in the European Parliament and throughout the legislative process, what should we do with specialized services? And originally they were intended to be the loophole for net neutrality, to circumvent the whole net neutrality by just making some service a specialized service. But now we really limited this danger to something that is um, handleable, and uh, now a specialized service can only be something which could technically not work over the open internet. Um, and um, you can see this clear here. I mean, that's a picture from the video that Facebook shows you when you have your birthday. And I found this so telling, because this power plug with a Facebook sign is exactly what a specialized service in the bad reading would be. It is no longer a universal connection that allows you to use every device with this network. Instead, it's just for one service. And if we go down that road, we lose the universal character of the internet, which allows us to do everything with it, every invention, every idea, on equal footing. With this model, it is one Facebook plug, one Google plug, and so forth. Another important issue that's still ongoing and not as clear as the previous ones is zero rating. A zero rating is the practice of exempting certain services from your data cap. So you have your two gigabytes, but WhatsApp does not count towards those two gigabytes. Um, the new rules say this has to be handled on a case-by-case -case basis. So it's quite dubious to see how this will play out. We have a few rulings now from Austria, Sweden, and one from Hungary. Um, but this is really an ongoing process. What is clear is that you cannot technically discriminate stuff with zero rating. So you cannot say, um, after you used up your data cap and the rest of the internet is blocked, you can still use the zero rated application. This is clearly prohibited. But about the zero rating itself, it's an ongoing process. Traffic management, the last issue, is the day-by-day -day operations of a network. So what do you do when you have a congestion, when there is too much traffic and the pipe is not big enough? How do you handle these? And we have a principle that says um, traffic management has to be application agnostic, so everything has to be treated the same. But you can have uh, exceptions for um, class-based traffic management based on quality of service characteristics. Um, but the burden of proof here lies with the ISPs. If the ISP wants to manage their traffic, they have to really have a justification why this is necessary and in line with the new law. And we will closely monitor how ISPs make this transparent and how NRAs will handle this. We are not really happy with the result on this one, but it's still a workable text. And now I'm going to hand over to my colleague. Thank you, Thomas. Um, you hear me well? Okay. Uh, basically, uh, Respect My Net um, is a grassroots tool we use for campaigning for net neutrality. Uh, it was built to try to uh, see what kind of infraction and violation you could see on net neutrality. It's an old tool, it has already a few years. Uh, we rebooted it for the last uh, campaign for the uh, BEREC uh, that uh, Thomas told you about. And basically what, it do, what we will use it now is to try to see how ISPs and operators are going to implement net neutrality regulation in Europe. So you, now what we have, it's a law. We have, um, as Thomas could say, different concepts that allows uh, good things and also bad things. Uh, however, the question is uh, to know how those things are going to, to be implemented. Um, so what it is now, it's like crowdsource the search for net neutrality violation. Basically, this tool allows you to 
input and to uh, see if there are uh, net neutrality violations or in your country or in, uh, in your op what, by your operator. Operator, sorry. Um, it, um, it could have a crowdsourced document of all types of net neutrality violation in Europe. And also it could be, we, ha we have a me too button that allows you to say if you've experienced this as well. And so you don't feel alone in front of your internet connection having problems and wondering if this is your connection or if this is a contract based or a general complication from the operator. You could see that if uh, other people already have it. Um, but uh, crowdsourcing, most of the net neutrality violation is not enough. What we'll do with all those violations? We'll just say, ah, oh, they're doing um, bad stuff. Well, um, as you say in French, that makes a good leg. But yeah, that's a joke that cannot be translated really. Uh, <laughs> Um, basically, we, are using, we will be using that to fix those violations and to allow uh, people to actually see that uh, pinpointing and to notice all types of violations could allow us to uh, fix them. When the Berek will review those uh, reg the regulation on net neutrality, and he will do that uh, periodically, uh, we can go and arrive with a, a huge document saying there are problems here, 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 and there. So, I'm already skipping in front of my uh, next slide, and um, it's a huge documentation, and uh, in our activist world of internet, when everything is very, very quick, and we are very quick on uh, new uh, information, it's hugely important to have good documentation and to remember what happened before, and so it doesn't happen again, especially on net neutrality, as, those, as this campaign has been ongoing for several years now. Um, the second thing that's interesting for that uh, type of tools is to allow telecom regulators to be accountable. So, for example, uh, French uh, National Regulation Agency really likes this tool because they can see what private companies are doing more or less behind them back. To give, to give uh, an example, after Belgian telecom operators, for example, Belgacom or Proximus, waited for the publication of the net neutrality regulation, and when they saw that zero rating were more or less accepted, but only will be blocked on a case-by-case -case, um, decision, they published and they issued a lot of new contracts and, uh, and subscription with zero rating. So, for example, uh, you have that uh, one also in Germany, if I don't, uh, if I recall well, that you can use your um, your data caps on your mobile device until a certain amount. And but when you reach that amount, everything is uh, down speed except WhatsApp. And that's in the net neutrality violation. And that's a really good example of what zero rating is. And that actually should be illegal. And that's what we have respect my net. It's fairly easy to use and it's a very lost cost, a lost cost of time because when you see what you have issues on your computer, you can check it out if you have a, a violation. Usually you can see that already in your contract. Um, and that's why we, we create um, a fairly easy uh, form. Uh, as you could understand, this is a very complicated issue and that involves a lot of different elements, especially when there are elements from uh, law, there are elements from telecom regulation, but we try to make it as simple as possible. And so you can see the different points on country, type of operator, the contract you have, is it a fixed or mobile um, line you have, and also the type of uh, uh, discrimination you can see. Here you have just zero rating because because that's the most, the, will be the biggest type of discrimination we'll experience in the next years. However, you still have uh, threat, throttling, um, class-based, contract-based, and so on and so on. When you, you input that kind of uh, discrimination on respectmynet.eu, you, uh, we, uh, behind, behind the scene on the backstage, we have a team that will review cases and to see if there are enough uh, information to use that as a, as a good case. For example, if you just tell us my internet is slow, that is not enough. Uh, that's why we try to make enough question, enough uh, place for you to describe, to, uh, to give as much information as you could and you can to, um, to develop uh, that. And that after it's shown on the, on the, on the web page. And after that, we gathered all that information, which is no 
personal identification information that were just identification on the type of cases. Uh, RespectMyNet.eu is um, a tool that has been um, on, on ongoing uh, development because we're trying to use it for something that has that it has not been uh, programmed for, and now we're using it to be fixed. Uh, for example, uh, to have um, a fixed type of. Um, sign flag let's say uh on the it's a certain uh, violation uh, we're try to we are going to develop uh on go, um, linguistic admin groups because for example i don't speak german and when you have um, a uh, input from a german speaking it's difficult to understand what it is especially when it's linked to the contract and we're trying to develop visual visualization of cases so if you have graphic designer or data visualization aficionado you're welcome to help us uh, um, basically, Respect My Net, as everything um, most of us do, it's free, like in free speech and like in free beer. Um, it's uh, easily to use, it's cross-source uh, database. So uh, if you like databases, come play with us and really get involved with that because there is a tremendous amount of work on a subject that does not involve terrorism, uh, which lately is very scarce. Um, we have everything of the information on our GitLab. You have the address here, uh, git.laquadrature.net. Uh, you'll have anyway that on the front page. And you have information on our wiki, wiki.laquadrature.net. Now, let's, we'll speak now on the future thing, and I'll let the scene to uh, Thomas. Thank you, Chris. So, um, how can we use this tool? How can we use Respect My Net? Because we now enter a stage on net neutrality as well as with the new general data protection regulation in Europe, where we have, have quite good laws, but now we have to deliver them to the people. Because it's not of much value if you have privacy in principle, but your data actually is in the hands of someone else. And the same with net neutrality. Um, it doesn't matter if you are not allowed to block services when, in fact, your internet is restricted by your ISP. And what we will do, um, particularly as uh, Epicent works, as our organization, we have this as a high priority to really work on delivering net neutrality to the people. Um, there is this concept of strategic litigation, which is um, well in place in the US, the American Civil, Civil Liberties Union, as well as the Electronic Frontier Foundation, pick their cases to really litigate for fundamental rights in a strategic way. And we want to apply these concepts now to net neutrality. And we've already done that in one case. Um, we looked at the violation of an Austrian mobile operator, 3 Hutchinson, and um, they did exactly this type of zero rating that I explained earlier is clearly prohibited, where you have this one graph, which is the violet one, uh, which is the public broadcaster um, in Austria. And when you reach the uh, data cap at uh, 2,130 seconds, it goes down to a flat line. But uh, free mobile TV service, their in-house television service, continues to run without interference. So that's a classical technical discrimination between applications, which is clearly prohibited. We submitted a case. It was successful. They cancelled this type of violation for all new contracts. And they changed the landscape of all their contracts. Because they could no longer give their own services a competitive advantages advantage, they quadrupled up to 17 times the amount of volume that you can buy with this operator. And this is not a singular phenomenon. We have similar cases in the Netherlands as well as with Slovenia. Once an ISP is no longer allowed to give preferential treatment to their own service, they start giving uh, more volume to all their subscribers, which is, of course, a really good thing. Um, but as I said, zero rating is one of the biggest problems that we have. And if you want to put it in numbers, around 40% of all internet providers in Europe currently zero rate at least one application. So this is really an endemic problem that you can find in almost every network and country. And so we really have to do something about it. Because there are drastic scenarios that are in front of us. Mark Zuckerberg announced two times already that he wants to bring um, his walled garden called Free Basic, previously internet.org, also to Europe. He recently also announced that he wants to bring Free Basic to the US. And 
Um, in the US, we have quite a hard time ahead. Um, Donald Trump is not really a fan of net neutrality from the few comments that we could analyze so far. And if you look at the three people that he appointed to his transition team for the uh, regulator at the FCC in the US, um, there is a quite horrible outlook. Uh, Jeffrey Eisenach, as well as Mark Jameson and Roslyn Layton are hardcore telecom lobbyists. And uh, you can really get a picture of what's coming in the US. If you look at the paper beyond net neutrality from Mark Jamieson and Russell Layton from June of this year. Um, what they propose here is to basically replace all net neutrality rules with a multi-stakeholder concept. But they have a very unique interpretation of what multi-stakeholder means. Um, they only limit this multi-stakeholder group to the 20 biggest industry players. They explicitly say no civil society, no consumer protection, no scientists. So it's basically the industry making their own rules. They also propose new barriers for every type of ex-ante regulation of the FCC. So that's basically putting net neutrality in a bin in the US, which would also risk the competitive advantage that the US has right now as the powerhouse of all startup innovation. If this really comes through, then only the startups that partner up with existing monopolies have a chance to compete. In Europe, uh, we also have um, a quite worrying proposal, um, part of the legacy of Günther Oettinger. Um, he proposed uh, in September of this year a new regulation for Barrick. Who, who here knows what Barrick is? Hands up. Oh, actually quite a few. It's good. Barrick is the umbrella above the European regulators for the internet. And it's uh, an agency that has done quite a good job on, on various occasions. They are a voice of reason. They have a quite a good model to really incorporate different views. And um, what the commission is proposing with this new law is basically replacing this agency, making it into um, an independent uh, legal personality and uh, having a complete control on all levels from the commission. So in this law, you can find the commission uh, writing itself into this uh, independent agency on many, many occasions. And the most obscure outcome of this is the executive director, as well as the quite powerful board of appeals, they will be chosen by regulators, but only from a list pre-compiled by the European Commission. And that's quite a communistic tradition of uh, democracy. Um, and we have to follow this dossier closely. It is, is now entering the legislative process in the EU, and if this would go through as it was proposed, this would basically mean that the agencies in task of enforcing net neutrality are under a complete power grab of the European Commission, which has proven times and times again that it is mostly interested in industry policy, but not really in the citizens' interest. Um, for all of that, we need you to put the violations that you come across in your daily internet experience into respectmynet.eu, as well as write to team at epicenter.works because uh, we are also very interested in learning about the violations that are out there and about really finding partners in various countries with whom we can submit cases to the regulators in that country and really keep the internet free and open. You can put it like that. With this new net neutrality law, we now have a toolbox to really keep the internet open. And with respect my net, we have a crowdsourced to-do list of all the violations that we have to get rid of. Thanks for your attention. And as a last word, um, uh, we were previously this organization, now we are this organization. We changed our name. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I think we have time for a few more questions. So please step up to the microphones if you have one, and uh, I'll call your number. Nobody so far. Is there a question from the internet? Also not. So you answered all open That's questions great. exhaustively. That is great. <laughs> no, there is a question there. There, there is, is a question. question. There. Oh, up there. Well then, number five. Please go ahead. Hi. Marin here. Um, my question as an yeah, IT guy is, um, 
Do you think about automation, the process to file this um, complaints? So I'm thinking about people run out their um, um, quota per month and they can easily start an app which checks about uh, 50 different services and see um, which services perform good and which not and automatically do a complaint on your site. Something like that. If I understand well your question, that if we, we are planning to automate the system of uh, inputting subscription uh, input in respect my net. Yeah. The, the thing is that that would, that would only cover a certain type of uh, violation. It won't, for example, I don't think in what I understood, uh, it won't uh, be able to cover, for example, uh, contract-based violations. Uh, but uh, that could be an idea. Why not? I mean, if you go to respectmynet.eu, you'll find a list of the measurement tools that are out there right now. Um, the, the software that you can use on your own computer to test if your internet connection is open and neutral. But most of the software is abandonware. Uh, sadly, it has not been um, updated in quite a few years. And then, then we need more developers to actively engage in those software tools. And I hope now um, that more people will do that because the threat in the US is quite real and uh, we need better software. Automated testing happens as part of some BitTorrent clients, for example, which upload their data to Measurement Lab. Um, and uh, there are some programs like that, but none really on a, on a wide scale. Okay. okay, so the next one is the person on microphone number three, please. Um, yes, I have a question regarding the um, regulation um, to reform Barrick. Are you planning to fight this regulation? And if so, and if not, um, are there any ways to fight it for the rest of us? Thanks for being eager. Um, um, uh, yes, we are uh, now, uh, this, is, this is just the beginning of this uh, dossier. So it, it has been proposed on September 14th of 2016. And now the parliament and the uh, council are just slowly starting to work on that. And it's part of a much bigger a uh, package of legislation called the Telecom Code. Um, and um, we, we are in ongoing conversations with the legislators and the various political parties to see what is the best strategy. And if, if we think that there is a reason to really have a campaign, then we will have one. But right now it is too early to say. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. And the next person on microphone number three. It's please. number four as well. Thank you very much for an excellent talk. Um, for Save the Internet, there was a lot of uh, national NGOs uh, active. And with this proposed power grab of Barrick, how can we, at a national level, um, help support the telecom, tele regulators nationally to save the net neutrality? The best thing to do right now would be to speak with your um, telecom ministry, infrastructure ministry, whoever is responsible of this in the, um, in the European Council, uh, because they are the ones that are now forming their opinion. And I know from quite a few countries where this is really an open situation, so they, they are welcoming input from citizens. And then, of course, speak with uh, the members of European Parliament from your country. They are the ones ultimately voting on this. Um, I'm, I'm not aware if we already have a rapporteur on that, but there will be one soon. And, on the uh, telecom package? Yeah. Del Castillo. De oh, my God. Uh, the, worst, <laughs> the worst rapporteur that we could possibly have, it's the same that we have for the net, head for the net neutrality law. Um, but, uh, yeah, speak with your local ministry and your members of the European Parliament. That's the right answer for that. Um, and uh, I hope that also a few countries and as well as regulators will see this power grab as what it is, because the, the commission is, is, is not really in the position to insert itself on all levels of government. Um, that's just the wrong approach. Okay, so it's time for one last question. Please, a short one. Number four. Thank you very much for the talk. Uh, I was wondering, do you think it's possible to actually convince telecom companies to uh, be on our side, so to say, and to um, get rid of all those uh, zero-rating things and convince them that uh, net neutrality can be a, 
a good argument for customers or do you think the only way is through uh, litigations and going to court? I think both. Um, there are, the problem with telecom operators is that you go against their business model. Zero rating can increase their, uh, their sales, their clean their percentage and so on, and the net neutrality cannot, or at least not in the, the way they see it. So um, there is two things. Like on one hand, you have customer protection. On the other hand, you have uh, private profits. So I think we'll be very welcoming any type of, uh, of arguments, of uh, advocacy that could link both and saying that uh, we are making a better world, but also we are contributing to capitalism. So that's, that's a tricky one, but you know, we can discuss it. But it's doable. I mean, there are a few ISPs that are fierce pro net neutrality advocates because they've realized that net neutrality is good for their business model because this open platform creates the demand for the only product they really have, which is internet access. Um, but uh, it, is, it is really a question of their understanding of their own business model. And for the most part, they would uh, either cannibalize uh, the, the uh, revenues of other companies that run on their network uh, instead of just being a mere pipe. Yeah. Um, but please try to convince them. We do as well. I would. If, if you want to discuss more, uh, we'll be around the tea house of La Quadrature uh, upstairs, so uh, you're welcome there. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Christopher and Thomas. <laughs>